Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, I think we're ready to get started. So if you'll go ahead and just mute yourselves for now, and then we can unmute uh, during the Q&A. I apologize, my camera gave out on me right before <laughs> I opened to join. So you'll be seeing my picture and not my moving face tonight. Um, but I think we, most of us know each other. My name is Jenny, I'm the Ecoflora Coordinator. Uh, thanks for joining us. Like I said, please remain muted. Um, and everyone who uh, has registered for this will receive the recording in uh, their email and also it'll be posted on our YouTube channel. I've placed links in the chat for our website and our newsletter in case you haven't seen those before. Uh, for those of you, again, not familiar with Ecoflora, we are a community science project that observes urban biodiversity and uses iNaturalist and encourages the naturalist community through events like this one, resources, and more. Each month we have a new EcoQuest, which is basically like a hide and seek game for different species, and this month we're focused on grasses. So here to teach us all about grasses is Liz Makings. Liz is the collections manager of the Arizona State University Herbarium. Grass identification can be notoriously difficult, and Liz is known as the go-to person for grasses in our area. She co-authored a guide to North American grasslands and is the point person for local floristic expertise, responding to inquiries and requests from faculty, students, and the general public on a daily basis. Liz teaches botany classes at ASU, such as Arizona Flora, Grasses of Arizona, and Sonoran Desert Field Botany. She mentors students, supervises interns and volunteers, and regularly conducts field work with students and colleagues. Very busy. Uh, she is also an administrator for SciNet, where she contributes to maintaining the digital data, taxonomic thesaurus, and image library. Thank you so much, Liz, for joining us. We're really excited to learn from you tonight. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and the floor is yours. Great. Everybody got my screen? Roger that. Got that. Okay. And I'm never sure about this. Is, are do you guys see the the thumbnail images of people too? Is that in the way or no? Or is it just the nope? It's just you and okay, your. So that I, I'm the only one that's seeing that. Okay. Yep. So, and we can see your uh, mouse too. So if you see my mouse too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So thanks, Jenny. Um, this is this is fun. I I love talking about grasses. Um, we got three hours, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, they're so amazing. They're so interesting. And keep in mind that I literally do teach an entire semester long class about grasses. So we're we're literally touching the surface here, but we'll do what we can. And I just also want to disclose that I'm I'm not don't believe everything I say. I'm I don't know everything. I'm not a guru. I'm just an enthusiast and I'm always learning more like you guys are. And um, there is an infinite amount to learn about grass. So the reason I do have some expertise though is that I did my graduate work on a really grassy place in on the San Pedro in Southeast Arizona. So I got the opportunity to collect and identify a lot of grasses. And I worked for a mapping crew on the Forest Service for seven years and, and, and gained a lot of experience there identifying grasses throughout the Southwest. For, so, for some reason, it's just a group that's really appealed to me. Um, I got attached to them and I kind of made it a point to learn more and they really interested me. And somewhere along the way, I started being the grass person. So I'm happy to embrace that and um, just fortunate to be able to do things like this with people that are interested and, and obsessed about grasses. So if you're ready, obsess, here's the plan. We're gonna talk about the phylogeny a little bit and the evolution, do a little grass ecology, some economics and then and then review the uh, important parts Does that sound okay so we're going to expand our horizons here um, and why not start with the intense and complicated angiosperm phylogeny this is um you're all familiar with this i'm sure right so don't be intimidated it's there's just a few things you need to know <clears throat> um it's basically uh, 
sort of scientists way of, of our best guess of how things are related, right? So nodes are, are things where there are common ancestors. So there's lots of nodes on here. And long lines are, are branches where we pretty much have no idea what's going on. So lots of, lots of stuff happened into here, surely lots of extinction, lots of speciation, but we just don't know, okay? But the nodes were kind of confident that something happened there and there's a common ancestor there. So, and by the way, what do I mean by angiosperm? Angiosperm is a flowering plant. And wait a minute, grasses have flowers, right? I get that question all the time. My family members even ask me this. So um, yes, grasses have flowers and they are in the group called angiosperms, the flowering plants versus gymnosperms, right? So grasses are, are a pretty old group. So they evolved way back here in the, in the early Cretaceous and we think they're about a hundred million years old because there's, there's lots of evidence for that. So grasses are in a family with a bunch of other things. And they're a group that's recognized because their members share evolutionary traits, right? For example, this is, this is the Poales clade. And at this point, from some hypothetical, hypothetical common ancestor, these families inherited characters, right? So they all have silicon dioxide in their epidermis, their inflorescences are indeterminate, and they all have two copies of their nuclear genome. So what does all that mean? Why is that important? It's not a coincidence, right? We know these families are related because they have morphological and molecular evidence that says so. So you may be thinking this is, this is really, well, this is pretty academic, but it's actually enormously important when it comes to classification so that we can talk about things um, of economic importance, for example, or um, uh, communicate about the natural world. So um, I'll give the talk about how botanists save the world for the umpteenth time another day, but um, classification is, is important. So, but what's the problem with classification? some reason my mouse is really slow. Um, what's the problem? They're theoretical. They are often, they're, they're only based on our current body of knowledge, right? So things change. And this is just an example here. Uh, not too long ago, grasses were thought to be related to this group called the sedges, the cypraceae. And they were, they were a sister group in, in, in a, a previous phylogeny. Um, and why? Well, it was, based on morphology, right? They looked alike. They all had these kind of bracky things. They, they're wind pollinated. Um, they have the same sort of you know, features, but we now know that this, that this isn't quite right. Um, and that grasses are actually more related to this group of Southern hemisphere, the so-called Gwanguanan distribution of plants and um, based on molecular evidence. So, um, Phylogenies are often wrong, and you have to always keep that in mind. And ironically, these, these families that they're related to are, are very small and not very species rich. So grasses are one of the biggest families in the world, and here they are, their nearest relatives are these kind of obscure things. So fun facts, right? Um, grasses are important, so we need to know as much as we can about them. And they are fairly well studied, and it's because they are an, the best group, right? And a lot of smart people are working on that. So the oldest record of a grass in as a macro fossil is about 55 million years old, found in an Eocene deposit in Tennessee. And we know that that monocots, probably grasses too, were around about 90 million years ago because there's pollen evidence of that. So promise this is the last phylogeny, but, but it's kind of important too, because this is to bring in home another point, which is that the concept of monophyly. So if a group is monophyletic, it's, it's a natural clade, right? It includes all the ancestors. It includes the ancestor and all the descendants. So members of the grass family are monophyletic. So the red is, is the grasses, the blue are their, their nearest relatives. And there's two features that 
unambiguously support that. And one of them has to do with the, the embryo in this kind of lateral and lower position. And the other one has to do with a, uh, some features of the chloroplast genome. So there's, there's evidence that says grasses are a monophyletic thing. Okay, questions about any of that? So we're moving on to grass appreciation. And they're easy to admire, they're beautiful. Um, they're the most important plant family on earth, economically and ecologically. And they're the only plant family on every continent and they are um, the most important by far to humans. So grasslands are, are some of the, the largest biomes on the planet and entire geographic provinces are even named after them. So you've heard some of these, the Velt of South Africa, the Pampas, Argentina, the European Steppe, okay? And oh yeah, the plains of North America, right? So why are there so many grasslands and why are they so dominant and how did they do it, right? So because they're smart and they know how to colonize and they've done so wherever they go. So the story goes that as continents were drying out and interiors becoming, interiors of continents were becoming drier and forests were, were sort of moving out, the grasses moved in. So they were, they were well adapted to, to sort of take over in these hotter and drier and open landscapes because of their adaptation. So where you have hotter and drier landscapes, you have, in terms of natural phenomenon, of course, wind and fire, right? So a little later, grazing undulates came on the scene. So you've got the perfect scenario for um, grasses to, to radiate. And they did that in a big way. And to the point where about 5 million years ago, we have pretty much all the lineages that, that are major lineages that, that are present today. So how did they do it? How did they become the most successful? And just sperms, well, the trick is, the answer is they do it all. They're really good at everything they do. Um, they're successful in dispersal, in establishment, and they have adaptations to basically every environment, and they're, and they're very competitive. So the evolution of the spikelet is really the key innovation that, um, in terms of their, their dispersal success. So the, the, the fundamental unit of a grass is a spikelet. And this is the thing that disperses the seed or seeds. And if you want to learn about grasses, you have to learn about spikelets. This is, this is the key innovation. This is the anatomically um, amazing thing about grasses is, is their spikelets. And spikelets come in thousands of varieties, right? So there's just a wealth of dispersal mechanisms that they, they have acquired or evolved. Um, you see a couple here, the, the, this Brisa is sort of wind blown. It's kind of little inflated spikelet. You can imagine that Synchris is probably easily, you know, carried by animals and so is any Apogon. So they've got hooks, they've got barb, they've got papery tissues, they've got floaties, they, they, they literally do it all. So um, there are lots of important traits too about their establishment success. Um, and one of them I'll spend a little time with is this, this generation time concept. So a lot of grasses complete their life cycle quickly. They germinate, they grow, they set seed, they disperse, and they senesce or die all within one, one season, one year, sometimes even, you know, a couple seasons. So, and why is this important? So why do you think that um, this contributed to their, to their success? Anybody want to throw something out there? Because they're is, forced to survive that way. Okay. What What is it about a short generation time that makes you, uh, gives you a leg up, I guess? They can quickly reproduce. Right, right. They can quickly reproduce. And more importantly, they, they can respond to a an opportunity quickly right so technically speaking you know a spatial or temporal opportunity so in other words can a saguaro respond to a spatial and temporal opportunity quickly no right 
they don't flower till they're 50 or 100 years old, right? So they, they, they're not as nimble as grasses. But, but, you know, imagine, for example, a landscape that's drought prone, right? Which subset of individuals is going to be selected for in the next growing cycle? Well, obviously, the grasses that are more drought prone. So people have all also selected for these traits that, that, that serve us, right? So we, we have, we've selected grasses for more starch, for seed head that don't shatter, you know, tall corn, short wheat, four row barley, six row barley, et cetera. So one of the reasons we have been able to manipulate these plants so easily is polypoidy. And polypoidy is a condition where you have additional sets of chromosomes, okay? You have more than one copy of your genes. And especially allopolyploidy, which is a, which is a combination of, of a entirely different genome. So it's extremely common in grasses and more than 80% of all grasses have are, are, are polyploid. And this is compared to about 20 or 30% of angiosperms in general. So why is this important again? Because polyploidy plants that are with multiple complements of their chromosomes are shown to be more likely to be able to successfully colonize new ecological niches. So it's a really important point. The grass embryo is, is also really important. It's a little more um, technical, but it has to do with the fact that <clears throat> the embryo is already differentiated before it's, it's, it even germinates. It's got sort of a head up on, on other seeds because it's, it's um, got primary shoots and leaves and even little roots. So also reducing the time to establishment. So, but there's a lot more. Um, this is again, touching the surface Grasses are, are interestingly because they evolved, they, they evolved in frost-free environments, yet they um, acquired frost tolerance many times in many clades over, um, over time. And so again, this opens up just all these other vast regions to colonize, right? Photosynth photosynthesis mode is also um, important and grasses have shifted their, their photosynthetic um, pathways many times from C3 to C4, I'm oversimplifying this, but C3 is generally that the sort of associated with colder and wetter environments and also tropical environments and C4 grasses are more adapted to drier and arid conditions. So they've got physiological adaptations and they also have a really amazing um, flexibility in their growth form. So they can, it can alter their comb height, their their structure, their branching, their rooting characteristics. And um, so why is this important? And they, they tend to colonize the, the first few centimeters of the soil too. So they, they have these fibrous roots. And why is that important too? It makes them effective at intercepting water. So they're very good at competing for resources. And then you've all heard about, you know, grass and fire, right? Fire, grass carries fire. and Right, it's true, but why is that? And it, and it, it has to do, again, with, with their architecture. They're so bunched together. They have volatile oils. Their resources, like, are, if you, whatever you see above ground in the grass, there's that equal amount below ground, okay? So they have this, this, this bunchy, below, low to the ground ability to carry fire, and they're very effective at carrying it and surviving fire. So this has to do with, this also relates to their tolerance to grazing <clears throat> and their immense below, below ground reserves. So sorry, this is the kind of Debbie Downer slide, but um, because of course grasslands are so productive and so amazing, we've exploited them, right? So for throughout human history, people have recognized it, that these are very fertile areas. So their overuse has led to a lot of changes, of course. You probably can name all of these. 90% um, uh, of our prairie is, is pretty much been converted to, to one of these um, one of these things. Okay, economically, grasses are pretty much peerless. Um, they are What are they? They are food, they are forage, they are fodder for our animals, they're building materials, they are our playgrounds, don't forget musical instruments, and of course, 
proof that God loves us, the main ingredient for, for our alcoholic beverages. So what I thought I'd do is run through a quick look at the big seven, what I call them. And you guys all, all know these aren't really in, in a sort of importance order, but, but kind of. So the, the number one usually on the list is rice because it's by far the most important crop for man. So it's almost consumed entirely by people. It's not a, it's not a forage crop at all for, for livestock. It's grown almost exclusively for people. And, and then number two is probably wheat. Um, this is the most widely cultivated cereal crop and it's about a third of the calories for humans. You can't really get through a day without eating something with wheat content, unless, unless you try, right? <laughs> um, so it's a temperate genus. It's, it's, it's domestically very old, um, origins in the Fertile Crescent, believed to be literally the reason for civilization. So you can basically blame wheat for everything bad about what's happened to us. We're sedentary. Um, we stopped being hunter gatherers. Um, we got fat, you know, we started having a lot more offspring. So why is wheat the chosen one? Um, well, remember that polyploidy thing. So wheat was easy to grow. It was easy to manipulate and it was one, of, it, it, it's turned into this sort of well-behaved plant that we see today. So it, it's high in starch, high in protein, fairly pest resistant. And so varieties were easily um, grown. So 90% of what we grow now is, is bread wheat. And a lot of it is also durum wheat that goes toward, because of the high gluten content used in pastas. I think corn is, is uh, number three on the list. And um, it's interesting because it's for a lot of reasons, but it's the only new world grain that's, that is, um, has you know, global importance, I guess. It's 80% of it is grown for livestock, for fodder, um, in the U.S. anyway. I don't know about globally. I suspect so. Um, but it's also used in uh, high, high fructose corn syrup and recently for biofuels, right? So corn is a rather unusual grass in that it's monoecious. So it has the male and female flowers are on different parts of the plant. They're on the same plant, but they're in different parts. So you all know the tassel and you all know the silk, right? The tassel are the male flowers and the silk are the female parts of the flower. And so the, the lots of varieties of corn um, in the U.S. anyway, and this is, this is very Western centric, right? But you have, you have popcorn with, with its expandable kernel. You have uh, flint corn, which is used in cornmeal and grits. You've got sweet corn, which is a real sugary one that we usually eat. Um, there's flour corn used for tortillas. And then this one, this picture here is called dent corn. And that's the one that's used for um, mostly for livestock. But of course, this is, this is just, you know, kind of America, US centric. There's obviously lots of varieties made for lots of different purposes, including Chicho beers and textiles and you know lots of indig indigenous varieties of corn. So oats is is the um, genus Avena. This one is a little less uh, important for consumption for humans too. It's only about five percent is consumed by people, and it's it, it it it's not it doesn't have the gluten, so it's not used in in bread. So usually when you're eating wheat, you're eating the whole your whole, the whole um, sort of kernel just flattened, right? Cordium is uh, also a, a pretty old cultivar um, with origins in the Fertile Crescent. And there's been remains found up to uh, 11,000 years ago in modern day Turkey and Iraq and Iran. And it's also one of those grains that's very rich in carbohydrates and so therefore uh, an ideal candidate for um, making beers. Anybody home brewer? Yeah. This one you may not have guessed. Uh, this is this is sakali or rye rye, and it's also used for for breads and and whiskeys. 
Um, and it's, it's important because it tolerates uh, poor soils, and, but it's also susceptible to the ergot fungus. So remember all these properties about grasses, they're high in starch, high in protein. They are, they are, they're excellent candidates for cultivation, but the annual habitat habit, sorry, is what made them easy to manipulate, right? So these are the characters that were selected for after each growing season. So each of these desired things could be, could be, could come about more quickly. So people have been GMOing for, you know, for, for millennia. Saccharum is the last one. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not grown for, obviously it's, it's grain. It's for the, the sugar content in the, in the stems. So it's a little, also a little unusual for grass that the stems are not hollow. They're, they're, they're fibrous and they're full of sucrose. Um, so again, other, many more genera that are very, very important depending on what part of the, the world that you're in, but they're, they're all grasses basically. So this is what you paid your money for. This is the, the morphological discussion. And you can't really talk about grasses without introducing the group that they belong to, which are the monocots. So for context, you kind of have to understand that. So here's just a cartoon of what's going on there. So grasses are um, about a fourth of all flowering plants. So they're, they're a big group, but they're not the biggest, but they have some of the biggest genera or families like orchids and lilies and grasses. These are very, very big families. Um, so compared to dicots, which are actually not a real natural group, but we still use the word for simplicity in comparison. So monocots and dicots, what's the difference? Um, monocots are indeed monophyletic. There's that word again, um, and a very recognizable group. And as early as the 17th century, there were people writing about it. And this, this was an English botanist named John Ray, who was the first to kind of sort of officially Western culture write about it. And so he, he made a lot of different observations about the monocots, including that there was this one cotyledon. So if you're like me and you're in this epic struggle with palm seedlings in your yard, um, that's, that's a monocot, right? You got the one leaf that sticks up. Um, so they're one of the earliest recognizable lineages and they're and they're also in the fossil record. So a single origin is generally accepted <clears throat> because they share these synapomorphies. It's just a fancy way of saying they, they have these things in common. Um, for example, monocots have a single cotyledon and they have parallel venation. Their vascular bundles, which is the stuff that carries the water and nutrients is scattered throughout the stems. Okay, it's not in a, in a, in a line, in a, a circle like in dicots so this tends to make you herbaceous you don't there's not an opportunity to make make real wood this way and um, their pollen is monosulcate which means that there's just one pore to which that opens that that where the pollen tube emerges and the root system is fibrous so they don't have a primary kind of tap root and then the other thing is the floral parts are usually in threes and dicots are usually in fours or fives. So you're experts on monocots. So what does it mean to be a grass? So you can cue your grass if you have it handy. Um, in addition to, of course, typical monocot characters, there's, there's things that make you a grass, okay? And there's things that unite them. So this is sort of the collective um, suite of characters that you can say, if they have these things, it's definitely a grass. The last two are unique. The, the others are, are not. Um, so what does it mean? First, their, their roots are fibrous. Um, their stems are hollow, except at the nodes. Their leaves are what we call disticus, which means that they're arranged on opposite sides of the stem, but they alternate, if that makes sense. So this is a picture of a rundo. This is the one I have behind me. You can see the leaves are, they're on opposite sides of the stem, 
but they're they're not opposite each other. And that the word for that is is disticus. Disticus. Sometimes if you look in a cornfield or you look in a sorghum field, you won't, that's not obvious. And you'll say, Liz, you, you lied to me. These, these leaves are whirled or they're, they're really, but it's what's going on is the stem is actually twisting. Okay. So the, the leaves are, are, they always like, they're always like this. Grasses don't change. They don't sometimes are whirled and sometimes, you know, they are always like that, but sometimes you'll get a little twist in the stem and it looks like they're, they're whirling around each other. Okay. So trust me on that one. Um, their petioles are, are, are modified into a thing, to, uh, a thing we call a sheath. So on a die cut, this, there's, there's the sheath. On a die cut, that would be the, the leaf petiole. What else do they have? So, so the junction of the leaf and the blade is, is a really important region in grasses. And um, we'll get to the details about that in a second. But there's a little thing called a ligule at that junction. And the fruit type is not, not special either. It's usually a caryopsis, but it can be other different other types of fruit. But the last two are unique, so um, you, you, no, other, no other family has this, this type of embryo and no other family has this molecular evidence. So there's this big copy region of the chloroplast genome that was inverted and all grasses have the same sequences. So we know they're, they're all grasses because they share that. So you, you can look at your grass now and maybe we can do this together. So um, like many, you know, groups, they have lots of parts and they're specialized, right? Like orchids and sedges and grasses. And of course it's botany. So they all have their own names too, right? So you'll hear me interchange a lot of things, but, but grasses kind of have their own terminology and, uh, and a complete set of, of, of words that don't necessarily apply to other groups. So and for example, the, the, the stem is called a comb. Um, you can call it a stem, but in grasses, we call it a comb. They're hollow and they're jointed. So there's, there's a comb here and it's typically hollow right here, but at the node, it's closed. Okay. So if you were to kind of if you had a razor blade handy and you could cut your comb through the middle of it, you might be able to see that the stem is hollow. And you might be able to see if you cut, cut it through the node or you cut it longitudinally that this part right here is, is closed. Okay, you should also be able to see this region here, this node, which is also really important in grasses. So there's the sheath, there's the blade, and then there's this thing called the ligule. I think the uh, the spider is also important to remember. The spider is important, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's try to maybe look at that. Um, the the uh, the node part. Okay. So what what you what you want to do is um, take your grass and literally just pull back the. The leaf, right? So as you pull back the leaf, you might be able to see that right at that junction of where the sheath and the leaf blade meet, there's something there, right? It might be a just some silky hairs. This buffel grass looks like it has just kind of a hairy ligule. Um, you might see something like like this in a Muhlenbergia, which is kind of this papery membrane-y thing. You might not see much of a ligule at all. You might see this big fringe of hair. So and why is that important? Because often um, these are reliable characters in identification and they're, they're consistent. So you can sometimes tell species or groups or genera or you know, sometimes groups often down to you know, pretty identifiable, identifiable group like a genus or a species just by the ligule. So that's, that's why it's really important. 
So anybody got a weird one or interesting one or a, or a, something that looks different than any of those pictures there? It's kind of good to have a hand lens if you. I know I said or, to uh, stay muted at the beginning, but y'all feel free to unmute and talk. Sure. You yeah. don't have to type in the chat. Can the sheaths be really long? Yes, they can be. Um, Especially for this part where we're looking at things. Yeah, here's so yeah, this is like, giant reed, so it's it, of course it's it is long, but from there to there is the sheath, right? So it's it's really long, and I'm going to pull that back and look at my legule, and not a whole lot going on there. Don't look like there's any hairs. There's just a little bit of a fringe at the tip there. One of the cool things about Arundo is that there is also at this junction of the leaf and the blade, this thing called an auricle. And it's kind of kind of just what it sounds. Um, it's it an ear, right? It's sort of ear-like projection. And a lot of a lot of these ligules are kind of expanded into auricles. So Arundo has an auricle. Uh, Hordiums have auricles. Not a lot do, but um don't know if any of yours will or not but you can you can look for that questions about the the ligule or the nodes or leaves or sheaths got that are you all seeing those in your are example you seeing them yeah everybody's quiet today quiet. Um, i was wondering <laughs> if the one of the ways to identify the um, um, buffalo grass is because of the the node or the, the ligule being hairy. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's probably not going to tell you that it's buffalo grass, but you know, if you're if you're if you have a vegetative grass and you're trying to identify it and you're wondering, is this something? You know, there there are definitely things you can you know eliminate. It, that's not a character in buffalo grass that I would say, yeah, okay, that ligule is buffalo grass, but sometimes they are, but okay. it, it helps. You, that's why you need, when you collect grasses, you need the whole thing. You need the, the roots, you know, and the stems and the flowers, because oftentimes the, all of, you need all of those to really know for sure what, what you got. So are there any, any other strange looking ligules? Or interesting or Don, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? Don? Oh, I'm busy looking. I'm having a just looking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly what you're saying. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, this is not... I'm busy. You're busy. Good. I'm busy Good. Here. Get to work. All right. <laughs> right. This is Johnson grass. It's not very interesting, but that you know, commonly there isn't much of a ligule. So you may you may not see you may not see that. This is Muhlenbergia longiligula. Go figure. Um, okay, so we'll move on. This is talking about habit, right? So what? How does it grow? And this is also pretty important. You'll see descriptions like tufted or cespitose or stoloniferous or rhizomatous, and all these things are important when you're identifying grasses because because sometimes also that can tell you be the difference between between species. So if you have a just a bunchy sort of growth habit, that's called like a bunch grass or tufted or cespitose. If you have above ground stems, that's stoloniferous. And if you've got underground stems, you're rhizomatous. And some grasses can do both, like Bermuda grass, for example. So we'll move on to the flowering parts. Um, so the grass inflorescences, um, this is where, you know, it, it, it can get a little bit tricky. Um, so remember the spike lid is the, is the basic unit of, of the grass. So it's a, it's the basic reproductive unit of the grass. And so this is why it gets tricky because technically a spike lid, right, um, 
there's a spikelet, there's a spikelet, is a, is an inflorescence in itself, right? It's, it's the equivalent of an inflorescence because what is an inflorescence? It's a group of flowers, right? It's a, but in grasses, when we talk about the types of inflorescences, we, we sort of equate a spikelet to an individual flower, if that makes sense. So for simplicity, a spikelet is a flower, even though that's not technically correct, right? A spikelet is not a flower. A spikelet can be a flower, can be one flower, can be two, can be many. So, um, but when you're keying out a grass, you're, you, you, you often come across the question of what type of inflorescence do you have? And is it the, the three main ones are the spike, the raceme, and the panicle. So you, you're probably familiar with this, right? A spike is an un, unbranched inflorescence. So um, the, the, the spikelets are arranged right up against the um, right up against the rachis or the, the comb, sorry. Um, and if the inflorescence is is unbranched, but there's a little bitty pedicel or a long pedicel. Um, you, we call that a racine. And then if the inflorescence is open with branching pedicels, we call that a panicle. Um, and of course, you know, it's botany and it's plants, so they're not following any directions. And there's lots of variation of, of that. So you can get spikeate branches, you can get digitate spikeate branches, you can get open panicles, you can get closed panicles. So but it is important to recognize what these things are and how, how they're arranged. So this is the next sort of look-see, what, what, what kind of inflorescence do you think you have in your grass? You know, just, just sort of spike, raceme, or panicle in general. Those are the, the three main ones. And if you don't know, you can just hold it up and I can look. Can you see this, Liz? Is this, would this be yeah. considered a yeah. panicle? So that's, that's gonna be similar to this guy, right? So it's a panicle. It's no, it's a spikeate branch, but it's a digitate spikeate branch. Because which means what? So, which means that like digits, like a hand, like a yeah. sort of fingers, you know? Yeah. Digitate means they sort of all come out from the same spot. Okay. And that's, that's pretty common in, in a lot of these, uh, in this, this group. Um, and what and the, reason it's a, you know, the reason it's a spike eight branch is that, that this, is, this, is, this is one branch of the inflorescence and this is another branch of the inflorescence, right? So it's, it's collectively all that, it's, it can't be a spike, right? Because a spike is only one, that's a spike. Right. Right. So you have spike eight branches. And what is this? Can you tell? <clears throat> it looks like it's um, digitaria. It's just crabgrass. One of the it's a type of crabgrass. Digitaria. Found it in the alleys. Yeah, that needs yeah. a lot of water. Any right. other questions? How about this one? Is this a, a spike eight again? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a tough one because you, you, if you looked at that closely, you would like, it does look like a spike, right? Right. And, and you know, you might guess that it was, and I, I would too, but I know better. So um, it's actually a, uh, a raceme. Oh, a raceme, yeah. Yeah, because it, there's, there are actually little pedestals there. Oh, okay. So each of the spikelets is on a, on a pedestal. So even though they're short, you know, they're, it still would be considered a racine. Yeah, you'd have to look at that under a microscope. Yep, <laughs> yep, well, they're, 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 right. And, and, and that's why, you know, they're intim intimidating to a lot of people because they're small, you know? Yeah. And, but you guys gotta get over that. The <laughs> so. recurring theme is that you have to take a close look have to take a close look and you have to get over that there's not this big showy Corolla flower colorful thing, right? But 
but there's once you get to know you know what to look mm -hmm. for and mm -hmm. what a spikelet is and what it, just the, 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 the tremendous amount of diversity that they have it's it's really really cool it's really fascinating and it's fun too because you you start being able to recognize and key them out and so it's a lot of satisfaction to and not a lot of people take the time to do it right so that's why it's kind of a good skill if you if you have it and if you, or if you're willing to put the time in but it, it's not easy right but nothing worth it is so so liz yeah. can you hear me mm -hmm. can you see this at all uh it's a little out of focus but put it closer i'm not sure can you see that better yeah just hold it still for a sec I'm trying. No. Keep trying. There you go. Can I make you bigger? I wish I could have made the other people bigger. Spotlight? Or how do I do that, Jenny? you can choose your uh view uh yeah view go speaker to view, view. and you can go. go to speaker how about if you want to stop sharing your screen for a second it might help okay let me share right, let's do that view speaker dawn the speaker. No, <laughs> Ann needs to talk and then she'll be the speaker. Okay, Ann, you talk. Okay, what am I supposed to be saying? <laughs> talk so you stay as a speaker. Oh, let me see that thing. I'm trying to keep it still. Yeah, back it off a little bit. Put it right by your face. By my face? Is you won't be able to see it at all. Oh, that's an Aristida. It's a, a Racine. That's going to be hmm, maybe a Panicle. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. But maybe a Racine. Because it's got, I mean, I think it's got a little bit of a petiole, right? That's what it's called. Yep. And the other thing you want to look at is at the tips of the spikelets, do you see that there's these little projections are called ons and they're divided into three. Yeah, in the older part of it. Mm -hmm. So that's an Aristida. It should be. You can see that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to spikelets now. So we can start looking at yours and knowing what I'm talking about here. Oh, you want mine again? Oh, uh, no, it's okay. It'll okay, good. So this, this is the money maker here, right? This is just the um, understanding that the grass spikelet is really the, the, the most important thing. So they're this, this really cool botanical shorthand. They're wind pollinated, so everything is reduced. You know, they just, they, they, they're highly, highly reduced they're, and highly, highly modified. And spikelets can be one to many flowered. They can, you, you think of a spikelet as a series of bracts because that's exactly what it is. Um, and the lowest bracts are empty, okay? Those are the, called the glooms, so they don't have any flower parts in there. And the other bracts enclose the flower parts. So there's a there's another bract that's called a floret. There's another bract that's called a floret, and the lemon and the pilea are the two terms for the the bracts that enclose the flower. So it's important to recognize a spikelet. And how do you know if you have a spikelet? The key is to find the glooms, right? So if you can you can tell where those sterile empty bracts start, where those two bracts are. Most of the time they're they're two, then you know you got a spikelet above that. So um, Here's a few pictures, um, you know, of, of that idea. So here's a panicle inflorescence of, of Avena. 
And then here's the spikelet. So there's a spikelet, there's a spikelet, there's a spikelet, there's a spikelet, and it's been dissected out. Okay, and how do you know it's a spikelet? Because if you were looking at this through a hand lens or through a scope, you would see that there's an empty bract, there's another empty bract, and then here's the fertile parts. So that collectively is a spikelet. Here's a picture of a part of a phragmites. So that's the, the another big reed inflorescence. So this is a big, big, bushy, branchy panicle. What's a spikelet? Each one of these individual guys here is a spikelet. And then here it is blown up. So this is the this is the lower gloom. That's the second gloom. And then the rest of these are individual flowers. Okay. Same thing with any apogon. So you're looking at this bushy thing. It doesn't make any sense. But then you get your hand lens and you zoom in and you see, oh, okay, there's individual spikelets. Okay. And this is where this is the first thing you have to figure out when you're trying to identify grass is what what exactly is a spikelet because it it it's the most important thing when you're when you're keying them out. Phragmites is not native to Arizona. Um, it's but it's very cosmopolitan. So there's some debate about how native it is. Um, because there's there's different uh, races, I guess you'd say, that that are from different parts of the world, you know. So it's kind of an interesting story. So it it actually might be native, <laughs> is is the 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 uh, take home message there. <clears throat> and we're learning that about a, a a a lot of things actually. So. Okay, here's another picture. This one's this one's kind of the classic grass spikelet that that everybody likes to likes to show. Um, this is a this is a bromus species in here in Arizona. So there's the inflorescence, right? So you're walking around, you go, oh look at that pretty grass, and you then you go, but where's the spikelet? And then you look in your hand lens and you go, oh there's one right there. And how do you know that? Because when you look at it, you see that there's an empty gloom, there's an empty gloom, and then so you start from there. That whole thing is a spikelet, okay? So spikelets are defined by basically by the, the glooms, and those are the sterile bracts at the base of the spikelet, okay? How do I know this is the first gloom? Because it's below that one. So you'll hear first gloom or lower gloom, second gloom or upper gloom. There's only two. Sometimes they're reduced or not there, but there will never be more than two. And then the first, how do I know this is the first floret? Because it's lower than the second one and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one and the sixth one and the seventh one. So just like leaves are arranged distinctly in a grass, so are the flowers, right? They're opposite and alternate. So you can literally go, if you, if you want to know where the, where the first gloom is, you just look at the lowest point, then you go to the next one, the next one. So everything, they, they kind of play by the rules when it, turn, when it comes to, you know, where they put, put their flowers. So they alternate on opposite sides of this little thing here, which is the kind of stem of the, of the spikelet, but it's botany, so it has a name. It's called the racula, okay? Any, any questions so far? No chatties? Okay. okay. Here's another sp spikelet lesson. Um, this is a this is a grass that grows like on beaches and things like that in in, uh, in uh, tropical areas. Um, and so here's a spikelet. It's a little narrow little pedestal. Here's another spikelet. Here's another spikelet, right? So how do I know? Because those are empty bracts, and that's where that well, everything above that are the fertile ones. So those are, so how many flowers does this spikelet have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So many, 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 and you can count the lemmas, and you can tell how many spikelet, or how many florets that a, a spikelet has. Could you spend a little time on the lemmas? Okay. Uh, defining them and their other part. 
the paleo. Okay. The lemma, lemma is always good. So the good thing is they do follow the rules, right? They, 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 the parts are where they should be. And a lemma is always going to be below the first bract of the flower part. Does that make sense? So here's a spikelet of a aerogrostis. Here's a blowout diagram of that. Those are the empty glooms. Here's the first flower, or first floret, and there's its individual lemma. So lemma is part of the flower. It's a bract that, that is just the first bract below the flower parts. And then here's the flower kind of opened up. Okay. So uh, ironically, or, or maybe interestingly, flower parts in grasses are not that important. So literally the, you know, the, 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 the stigmas, the styles, the, the stamens are, are of very little importance when it comes to identification. They're, they're usually the same. There's three stamens and two stigmas and two styles but they don't have much importance when you're, when you're looking at, when you're trying to figure out what kind of grass you have. What is important are the spikelets and the bracts in the spikelet. These little things are called lodicules and they're, they're the, the sort of theoretical corolla, I guess you, you'd say, or petals maybe, uh, but the jury is still out on that. We're not really, as far as I know, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, consensus to, to what those actually are. But they're very important when, when the grass flowers because when, when it flowers, these things um, fill up with water and they, they force the flower to open. So that when you see a grass flowering, like here, for example, see how the stamens are coming out here? Here they are, they're opening up. The lodicules are responsible for that. They're the thing that, that opens up the individual uh, floret. That answer your question, Don? Lemmas are, lemmas are, are, there's only one in each floret, okay? So there's a lemma, there's a lemma, there's a lemma, there's a lemma, there's a lemma. So what's this thing? It's the other bract in the floret and that's called paleo because it's grass speak. So, the, the, the bracts all have their own names. Okay. Remember that thing about diversity? Dispersal, flexibility, right? So here's a, a just, just kind of a montage of, of lots of different types of, of spikelets. These are, these are all local. You can find these, you know, in Arizona. So I'll just go through these because it's kind of fun. Sporobolus is a, is a, is a single flowered spikelet. So there's a gloom, there's a gloom, there's a lemma, there's a paleo. And these are the big giant anthers. So it has really big anthers when it, when it flowers. Uh, this is Hilaria. And it's kind of fun because it's, it's got three spikelets arranged in this kind of fascicle. And this, the central one is the fertile one here. And the side ones are, there's actually two flowered and they're probably staminate or sterile. So grasses do a lot of that kind of tricky. They don't have fertile spikelets a lot of times. They'll be staminate or they'll, they'll be male parts in there, but there won't be other, there won't be the female uh, parts. Um, see, Katia is, is uh, one of my favorite grasses, grows down in kind of southern, southeast Arizona. There's, I dissected it out here for, for just to show the articulations. So there's the lower gloom, there's the upper gloom, and then this one's probably one, two, three, four, five, or five or six flowered. Um, and, and the lemmas have these, all these little awns that are kind of dissected into. Any apogon is another one that kind of does that. So the glooms are down here and then there's a, there's a flower here and there's a flower here. But they are, the, these are the kind of the veins, you know, that are extended into on. So grasses are very um, good at making these, these ons. I think it's probably has to do with, you know, grazing animals and, and dispersal. 
if you know one panicum, you know them all um, because their anatomy is their morphology is the same no matter what, and it's an enormous group. So this is a really good good group to know. Um, this is the lower gloom. This is the upper gloom. This is this is actually the first lemma, which is a sterile uh, flower, and then this is the fertile one. So they're actually two flowered, but the lower flower is, is um, sterile. And in, in the panicoid group, this lemma looks just like a gloom. So I know I'm going fast and there's a lot here, but um, this, is a, this is a group that once you understand this, this arrangement, you know a lot of things because it's it's very, very important group, very common. And this fertile lemma is often very firm and sometimes shiny like it is like it is there too. Sinophilus is uh, two flowered. So here's one flower here, there's another. So there's a lemma, there's a palea, there's a lemma, there's a palea. Chismus is really cool. Um, it's got lots of florets and then the glooms are super long. They go all the way, by the way, these are millimeter scales. Okay, so you can see how, how small some of these are. Uh, but these glooms are, they exceed the length of the topmost floret. Uh, Sencris is another really cool kind of, uh, this isn't a spikelet. The spikelets are inside here. Um, this is called, uh, what is it called? Um, it's kind of like a conglomerate of things. Fascicle, yeah. So this is a fascicle of spikelets. Um, if you've ever stepped on a sandbur, you know, they're pretty nasty. Um, here's a pretty straightforward spikelet, lots of, lots of florets. Here's a not so straightforward one because the, the lower gloom is actually missing on this, on this um, genus, Tragus. And then this is the upper gloom and it's got all these little hooked kind of Velcro projections. So that's a really, really neat grass. This is Timothy or Phleum, so you can see the long glooms on there. So what's the point is, you know, it's, it's, it's a big group. It's very diverse. It's, um, they're super cool, um, but you do need to spend time with them, right? I mean, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of kind of hidden things that, you, you know, you may not, that aren't that straightforward to, to understand. Like, for example, like, who knew that there's no second gloom there? You know, you, you just kind of got to read about these things to, you know, to get to know them and to just key them out, you know, just work with, work with reference material to just, it's, it's a struggle. I mean, it, and it's great if you got somebody that knows something that can, can help you out. So it's, it's hard on your own, I know. Um, and it's good to have a, a good instructor. So maybe we'll do that one of these days. Let's have another. I've done this before where we've had um, kind of grass class, you know, for, for a couple days, just a crash course where we just key out a bunch of grasses and look at them, and do drawings and stuff. So DBG's interested in that. I'd be, I'd be willing to do that again one of these days. So Great. Yeah. I think that yeah. sounds like fun. It is yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. It's up the whole world you now because you really do have to have a microscope, right? Like you, you, this thing is three millimeters long, right? You're not going to see this unless this tragus is like two millimeters long. But but look at all the you know the anatomy and the detail and the ornamentation. You know it's, it's just mind blowing to see them through a microscope. Uh, I don't have a field guide. I don't. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there are things out there, you know. Um, if you're really ambitious, <clears throat> uh, I'm told that Colorado's has a good field guide. I don't have a copy of that, but, but. Um, Somebody told me that's a, that's a pretty good one. It's like grass is a Colorado field guide. Um, the problem is, is that we, we, our, our, you know, our reference material is very old. 
in Arizona. So, and um, there's the thing, there's a Gould, G-O-U-L-D book. Um, it's called, I think it's called Grasses Southwest. So it's got Arizona, New Mexico. And, um, this one's pretty cool, pretty good. Grasses at Trans Pecos. This is um, Michael Powell. This is the book that is the most recent uh, treatment for the for the whole yeah. North America. So it's 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 very good. Um, it's just the problem with treatments of the whole of North America is they're not regional, right? So you you that's a disadvantage when you're just all you want to know is wait, I just want to know what Boodaloo is I have in Maricopa County, you know. So there's sign it. You know, don't be afraid to look at pictures and compare there. That that's super useful. Uh, Liz, what was the title and author of the book you just held up? This one is it's a group of authors. Mary Barkworth is is the main author. And what's the title? The Grass Manual of the Grasses of North America. Thank you. This is the paperback version. There are two bound volumes, 24 and 25, that are more expensive, but they do have descriptions. This one has keys um, and illustrations, but the descriptions are, are, I think they're shorter. But it's got it's got nice uh, you know, it's got nice illustrations and line drawing so it's pretty good. This is the big one that this is the volume if you want the real thing that comes in the hardback and there's two of these so mm. they're a lot more expensive. And so it's an investment. Um, just come to the herbarium and borrow it if you want to. <laughs> Don't buy it. Have you seen this one? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Does that have the pictures of ligules and things like that? Yeah. Got a lot of vegetative pictures. Yeah. That looks good. Yeah. That looks real I good. I like it. Yeah. It descriptions. Does it have keys? Or are they just kind of picture book? It does have a little description, but... I don't think it's as, it goes into the details like you are. Right. right. Yeah. So, you know, pictures are great. Um, and, and those guidebooks are great. You just got to be careful because they're not comprehensive typically. So you could often have something that isn't, is not in the book. Right. Yeah. Just because there's so many grasses and and picture book that just flips through isn't gonna really tell you anything. So you have to just be careful with the reference material. But you know, using Cynet and making lit species lists of things that are in your area, um, and then you know, there's just there's getting to be a lot more better pictures there that you can use to identify. It's tricky, right, with grasses because you can't a lot of times identify them by by a photo, but Sometimes you can. So Liz, do you think yeah. there'll be any future effect of climate change on grasses? You put rice as number one and that's a real water, high user water, so. Right, right, that's a question, right? I mean, yeah. how, how, are, are they how much adaptable? can these things be, right? Can they be pushed to, to where they're, you know, they're still adaptable? I mean, if my money is on grasses because they, they they are very adaptable and they're very plastic and you know they've, they've just got a lot of built-in sort of genomic characters that that you know will hopefully serve them you know in a drier hotter climate at least in the southwest anyway but you know it just depends on where you're at right you're going to be wetter in some areas you're going to be drier in some areas you know there is a lot of research that's going into cultivating rice that is a lot more tolerant of salt environments, you know, um, so things like that. I, I, well, I could also see shifting of where rice is grown as some parts of sure. the world 
become more drier where they grow rice and you sure. move it to where there's more water. Right. So there, there are people that work on cultivating rice in drier environments. They're, work, they're right. working on cultivating rice in saltier environments and, and so on. So. Uh, Joni asked in the chat, is it best to start with a known grass and look at the parts and then get the language down? That's a great idea. And it, it's it, yeah. right to start with something that you, you know the species and then cheat, you know, go through the key <laughs> by, okay, I know this is where I'm supposed to, this is the, the couplet I'm supposed to take. And um, that, that helps me a lot. Or just send me a picture. I have a whole bunch of fossil creek grasses yet that need to be ID'd. So really, yeah. Yeah. Anything interesting? Oh no, I think Chris probably did all the interesting stuff. <laughs> but there's some stuff that's just like she never got quite through with it, and then COVID hit. So yeah, yeah. Are you still getting out? Uh, Dawn and I went last. When did we go, Dawn? Last September, I think it was. Oh, so you didn't get the good. Not this past huh? September, but the September before, because this September is closed. It was September 2020, and then like they had the fire and we couldn't get in. Yeah. Oh right, the strawberry got hammered. We got some. We were. We did some good collecting though. We had to. We did. We were. We were going after the. Um, uh, gallium column A. And, and we found it. And we found oh, cool. it along the road there. So I never did find any um shoot. It also is column A. But the anyways, there were several things we never found that we should have found. So hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, we're heading uh, into about 20 minutes over. Liz, is there anything else that you'd like to- It's been wonderful. Yeah, I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so you you guys, you know, of course can have this, all these diagrams and play with that. Um, Liz, is it okay you, if I share your slides when I- I, I was gonna say, you, could, you can share the PDF, you know, if people wanna review it. And, Thank you. I appreciate that. Use the diagrams. Yeah. It's very helpful. Yeah. I'm gonna... it's, you know, this is not ideal, obviously, to be looking at grasses and on the web. For anybody that doesn't have it yet, I slipped my email address in the chat. Liz, if you feel comfortable, you can put yours in there too. So if you guys have any questions, you can message us. And we'll take a look at doing that, uh, that grass class through DBG, I think that would be really fun. Yeah, I think, you know, we just charged everybody 25 bucks or something and, and just like a two day crash course, and sit in front of a microscope and nerd out on grasses all day. <laughs> the nerding out is the fun part. Oh, it's fun, <laughs> yeah. Awesome, does anybody have any last minute questions? Got a lot of no, things. I've done, I, I would just like to say I've done this like twice looking at some of the stuff and this was it's really helpful just to be reminded of you know, sure. right and that, you're not gonna remember it unless you keep do it. Yeah. Keep doing it. Yeah. It's just it's just one of those things. It's gotta I mean, you know, I my brain, I forget all the winter annuals every year. Gotta relearn them, you know. It's, it's just you just gotta keep keep quizzing yourself yeah use it or leave do you do you primarily just use a hand lens or do you have kind of a portable oh you you have a whole kind of scope no I, I i mean rarely would i try to identify anything in the field i mean of course i know a lot of stuff already you know because it's common and and you know i just experience but if i'm trying to figure something else it out it's it's under a microscope okay so you'll yeah. kind of just press it and take it back with you. Yeah, yeah. Press it and you know make a specimen. And if, if you're not if you're not going to make a specimen, you don't have to press it. But because grasses don't, they're not like like other flowering plants. Right. Like if you collect it and you don't press it right away, 
just they won't last yeah you know grasses will last a lot better because they're already kind of flat you know so but if you're gonna yeah make a collection then then press it and make sure you get roots and and all it's important hilaria rigida is a good one to kind of become familiar with because it's a larger plant so i like that one to that's a nice one it's a nice kind native, of explore and it's also one of those that, you know, looks a lot like buffalo grass. And mm. I've seen people mistake it for that, like, especially when it gets older and, and, Oof. you know, the, the inflorescence is kind of falling apart. Yeah. You know? So you just got to also be careful what, what you don't, don't be pulling out natives, you know. <laughs> uh, some things somebody said earlier about looking for the hairs at the ligules. That's a trick that I heard uh, before. I, it was to tell between buffalo grass and another grass that looks very similar. Right, right. And and it was using those hairs to be able to tell that it was buffalo grass. Yeah, and I don't I don't know what 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 those characters are, but 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 that's that happens a lot. You know, just just gotta be careful. Well, it's like I'm assuming that's something that can come down to length of hairs or you know things like that. Just because sure. that is hairy doesn't necessarily make it you know that distinguishing characteristic. No, there there it can get down to you know short Millimeters. stiff hairs <laughs> or long fluffy hairs or yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to your point, Caitlin, yeah, it it may be that it is hairy, but you know it could be something even more, you know, definite that makes it distinguishing. So are you, are you going to email the PDF or, or? Yes. Yeah. I will. Lori, Lori's saying she, she, she'd like a copy. Yep. Everyone that's registered and I've taken her email down and yeah, everyone that's registered, you'll get this recording in your email and I'll send the slides and also the links that we've talked about. So all those will be in that email for everybody. Appreciate it, Jenny. What was that, Don? I said I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I put a few links here. It's uh, they're not that great. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's most. This is mostly kind of taxonomy stuff, but um, yeah, there's lots of stuff on the web. You know, the grasses are a big deal. You know, so. A lot of people are looking at them and studying them. You know, there's a lot of global websites. The, the this this manual, this Florida North America manual, is online. That's good. To say that. Yeah, and that's really it's not super user friendly, but the, all the keys are in there, the descriptions are in there, and and the, so that I I'm not a big like use the computer. I I much prefer a book. So I haven't used it very much, but I'm told that it's, it's very good. Awesome. Well, I think that's it. If no one else has any questions, thank you all so much for joining us today. Liz, thank you again for sharing your Welcome. knowledge and your grass enthusiasm with us. No problem. That was fun. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, good to see you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Liz. Bye. Good to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Jenny. Bye. Bye.